here in Whitehead Presbyterian. Welcome as well if you're joining us online. It's uh, wonderful to know that because of Christ we gather in the, in the intimate presence of our living God. That it is his delight and his joy to promise and to, and to be, that we can be sure that he is here with us. And we seek to glorify his name in our worship and in our lives and in all that we are and all that we have. Lovely to see things uh, continuing to ease up. We're all looking forward quite a lot to the next big step, being allowed inside a coffee shop. I know, honestly, there's the no end to the joy. And, and, and six people can sit around a table in a coffee shop from the 24th, from, from six different households. I know. And, and, and you can go and, and visit somebody and stay over in their house. You can do like a long visit. You can have a long weekend or a long day with somebody. So lots of, uh, of wonderful opportunities to, to reconnect and rebuild and, uh, and renew friendships and relationships. The choir are going to lead us into our worship this morning with Christ be our light. Thank you, choir. Alec, thank you choir. It's a lovely piece. Um, 
we gather to worship and I want to read just a few verses from, from Psalm 96 this morning. Say among the nations the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will sing before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. Amen. The Lord bless his word to us today as we worship. We're going to stand and, and sing together. Uh, we're going to sing from the hymn book number 488, As the Deer Pants for the Water. Let's worship God together. whenever you get um, whenever you rent or buy a DVD and uh, and and you get to the and you, and you kind of come to the menu and there's a little bit in the menu called bonus features well anybody who's watching this online you're going to get a bonus feature because uh, the little clip that I was going to show for the children right now um, unfortunately isn't making it to the live performance uh, it, it, it wasn't on the, uh, I, I say it wasn't, that implies that something else happened other than my own uh, stupidity. Uh, so unfortunately the little clip isn't going to be with us, but do go online and check it out because it's very good. Hi Dino Kid Songs. I love my beautiful planet, I love my beautiful planet, all of the animals, insects and plants, its rivers and oceans, skies and the mountains too, and for many, many reasons, but above all of them, but above all of them, I love the earth because this planet is my home. And because this is my planet, and because this is your planet, and because this is our planet, beautiful earth, let's enjoy it, and take care of it, there's no other like it. Fair trade means fair for people and planet. It means a fairer deal for farmers and workers on the front line of the climate crisis to help them deal with the huge challenges climate change is already causing them. Challenges like less fertile land, failing harvests and more extreme weather. 
It means our eco-friendly fair trade standards. And it means expert advice on sustainable farming techniques from our fair trade producer networks who offer support all around the world. But why does fair trade care about the climate crisis? Because the climate crisis isn't fair. Farmers like Sidi and his family contribute least to this crisis. Carbon emissions per person in the UK are 28 times bigger than those of someone in Sierra Leone, but they are the ones getting hit the hardest. And unless we take urgent action, things will get worse for hard-pressed communities around the world and for the future of our favourite products. Up to 50% of land used for coffee could be unusable by 2050. Plant diseases are becoming more common. Cocoa trees will be harder to grow in West Africa. Wine production could reduce by 40 to 50% in South Africa and Chile. But we can choose a better future with Fairtrade. Fairtrade exists precisely to help those in need get through a crisis and win justice in the longer term. Whether that's a trade crisis of unsustainable prices, the COVID-19 crisis, or the huge challenge of the climate crisis. So how is Fairtrade helping tackle the climate crisis? When you buy Fairtrade, it means farmers and workers getting at least a guaranteed Fairtrade minimum price and an extra payment known as the Fairtrade Premium which they choose how to invest in their communities and farms. That means more resources to deal with the escalating challenges climate change brings. This could mean planting new trees, new climate smart farming techniques, or coping with more extreme weather patterns. Sadly, too many farmers and workers simply don't earn enough to do any of this, which is why our global fair trade movement is campaigning for all farmers and workers to earn a living income so communities, businesses and families in the Global South can survive this crisis. But with our fair trade producer networks, fair trade is there on the ground too, giving expert practical advice Fair trade farmers are on the front line of the climate crisis, but are working to win a better future for our planet. They work in line with our eco-friendly fair trade standards, bans on deforestation, commitments to reduce carbon footprints, protections for biodiversity. So every time you choose fair trade, you're choosing a better future for all of us and the whole planet. Action on climate change is in our hands. Share to help us win a fairer future. I love my beautiful planet. I love my beautiful planet. Forest and deserts, jungles and tundras, even if it's cold, even if it's hot too. And for many, many reasons, but above all of them, but above all of them, I love the earth because this planet is my home. And because this is my planet, and because this is your planet, and because this is our planet, beautiful earth, let's enjoy it, and take care of it, there's no other like it. I love my beautiful planet, I love my beautiful planet, all of the animals, insects and plants, its rivers and oceans, skies and the mountains, forests and deserts, jungles and tundras, even if it's cold, even if it's hot too. And for many, many reasons, but above all of them, but above all of them, I love the earth because this planet is my home. Um, it's one of those funny things, uh, you can explain climate change to a child in a way that they will instantly grasp it and understand it and know and know what's happening and, and have a sense of what they ought to do. And yet we have uh, a culture of, uh, of, um, I don't know, of, of conspiracy theories and, uh, and people complaining that it's not all it's made out to be. And, I mean, we've seen it during the, the whole COVID crisis with vaccination deniers and stuff like that. It's funny how people, even when confronted with truth and overwhelming evidence, would still rather do their own thing, would still rather follow their own way and their own desire rather than do what good sense and, and science and understanding explain to them.
is the right thing to do. I think sometimes we are our own worst enemy as a people. But as I say, that, 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 that's a lot heavier than what you'll see online, which is much light, much more light-hearted. And there's, there's even a little song uh, which I hope you will look, up, look at and enjoy. But we're going to carry on in worship and we're going to sing together. We're going to sing the King of my heart. So let's stand and praise God once more. <clears throat> Uh, for you this morning. Um, as you know, we're, we are undertaking two different collections during this month. Uh, the first one is, is for the Presbyterian uh, Orphan Society, Presbyterian Children's Society, and uh, I'm um, delighted to have the opportunity to, uh, to make up for the fact that we weren't able to, to take this offering in February. And hopefully you will have uh, picked up a, uh, a little envelope in the pews and, uh, and we look forward to receiving your no doubt generous gift. Um, a gift that goes to help uh, families um, in, uh, in, who are connected with the Presbyterian Church uh, who come into, our, our, uh, um, come into our orbit and who are in need. Um, we're very loose in terms of our, our definition of Presbyterian in, in terms of the Presbyterian Children's Society in that it, we aim to be generous and, uh, and I encourage you to support them. And then I'm particularly delighted this morning to have uh, Rosie, sorry, Mrs. Rosamond Bennett, the CEO of Christian Aid, who is here to share with us this morning uh, about the, the work and the, uh, the challenge uh, facing Christian Aid, um, not just this week, but maybe over, the, over this last year and, and in this year to come. Uh, so really looking forward to hearing what Rosie has to share with us this morning. Uh, you'll also find Christian Aid envelopes, um, hopefully in the pews. And, uh, and again, I encourage you please to, uh, to take it home to, uh, and to, to think carefully and prayerfully and to and to give generously because for all the the troubles that we experience here there are many nations around the world where christian aid is at work uh, where the challenge is even more grievous and uh, and and difficult so uh, let me again encourage you in that and then members of kirk session please note there's a, a kirk session meeting uh, on tuesday week 
and uh, that will be on Zoom. Uh, so uh, just a wee reminder for you there. Uh, we're going to continue in praise. We're, going to, we're singing some beautiful pieces this morning. Uh, we're going to sing uh, a few verses of this beautiful hymn, 628, Beauty for Brokenness. So let's worship God together. safety. We look out on a world filled with trouble. We look at the, at the conflict that has broken out afresh in, uh, in between um, Israel and, and Hamas. We pray, Heavenly Father, that, uh, that you would intercede and intervene. We pray, Lord, that you would bring peace as so often in these conflicts, Lord, it is the, the vulnerable and the, uh, the peripheral who suffer the most keenly. And Father, already so many have died um, between, uh, between missile attacks and reprisals. And Father, there is, uh, there is little hope for peace in the midst of such such violence. So, Father, we ask that you would restrain the, the offence and the, and, and the heartache, that you would, that you would give a, a determination to, to bring peace, a willingness to, to forgive, that you would restore a sense of, of opportunity 
and, and allow both parties to walk away from this. Lord, we pray for transformation. Transformation of hardened hearts and closed minds. Minds that are resistant to the, the changes needed. We think of our, our, the wider challenges facing our planet. We pray, Lord, that there would be a, an openness, a willingness to embrace the need for sustainable and, and, and thriving farming and agricultural methods. We pray that a, that a determination to, uh, to win a better future for all of your creation would, would, would be at the heart of, of each of our choices. We pray, Lord, for all creation. We pray, Lord, that you would, you would shatter the stones of apathy and indifference. Help us instead to recognize as our hearts become, become hearts of flesh, filled with concern and compassion, that the, that the challenge of, of, of self-preservation the, and the temptation of, pri of prioritizing ourself over others and our wishes and our desires and our, our greed. We pray, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to let that go that we might become a people filled with hearts determined to secure generosity. We pray, Lord, that you would help us be committed to overcoming a fear of scarcity that is so, so common around the world, and that we would allow ourselves to be filled with a desire to share generous abundance. We pray, Lord, that you might that you might dissolve the stones of judgment and shame that are so prevalent in our world, that you might instead fill our hearts with your mercy and your grace, and that those uh, heavy weights of consumerism that fill our hearts so easily might become hearts that are satisfied, hearts that find that lead us into ever closer communion with this amazing creation that you've made. Transform us, we pray, by your spirit, that we might be your people and that you are God. Father, we continue to pray for our, our little corner of the world here. There are clearly major frightening challenges facing us. We pray for our political uncertainties. We pray, Lord, that, that, that our certainty would be found in you and that the, this determination to score points or to, uh, or, or to uh, in the guise of standing firm, that actually we become an immovable object or an irresistible force. And instead, Lord, we uh, instead, Lord, we we become a problem rather than a solution. So, Lord, help us, help those who lead to hear Your voice in all of its mercy and grace, in all of its kindness and gentleness, in all of its faithfulness, in all of its self-control in all of its determination to look beyond ourselves and our tribe, to bring hope to the lost and the despairing. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. I'm delighted now to ask Rosie to come and share with us. Rosie, it is lovely to have you here in, in this capacity. We know you're here reg regularly and often, but it's lovely to have you here sharing with us about the work that you're involved in. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Get all my bits and bobs gathered up. Good morning, everyone. 
This is the first live speaking engagement I have had in a year. <laughs> Everything is being via Zoom. <laughs> and I couldn't wish for a better place to do my first one, so it's great. Um, it's lovely to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I want to start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for the support that you as a congregation have given Christian Aid and also me personally over the years. Um, whether that's through your Christian Aid Week envelope or direct debit donation or taking campaign actions or praying. So I want to thank you for um, everything that you've done. Um, Jason, I'll just tell you each time for the slide. So if you could put the first one up, please. Um, so this year we're marking 75 years. Well, in true Irish fashion, it's sort of six, we're sort of into the 76th year. We missed the 75th because of COVID, so we're extending it slightly. Um, and so it's been 75 years since Christian Aid was started by the churches in the UK and Ireland. And we were set up to respond after the, as a result of the aftermath of World War II. Um, Jason, if you show the second slide. So many people have been forced to flee their homes and due to the fighting across Europe, and they ended up living in refugee camps. And the churches at that time were moved by their faith to do something uh, to help those in need. And so they set up Christian aid in response. And in the 75 years since then, um, with the support of the churches, we have been working all over the world to lift people out of poverty. But we started in Europe and we started with refugees. Now, we've got four guiding values, um, and that we base all our work in these, dignity, equality, justice, and love. And this morning, I want to focus on love. I want to talk to you a little bit about that, because in so many ways, love is the foundation that the other values, dignity, equality, and justice all flow from. So um, I want to read you a couple of verses from 1 John chapter 3 verses 16 to 18. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Now, there are five books in the Bible that are uh, attributed to John, the Gospel of John, uh, the three letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelations. And one thing that really comes through these books is the theme of love, especially in 1st John. The word love appears 35 times, and yet it's a really short book. It's only five chapters. Now, there's a story about John that when he was an old man, he used to be asked to preach. And apparently, he would often get up and say, little children love one another, and then sit down again. And those listening used to be upset because they'd heard this so many times before, and they wanted to hear something more and something different. And they would ask him, why do you always preach the same sermon? And he would reply, because it is the Lord's command, and if it alone is kept, it is sufficient. Now, in the Gospel of John, there are numerous mentions of a mysterious disciple who's never directly named, but is referred to as the disciple that Jesus loved. And some have suggested that this may have been John himself, and this might have been a sort of nickname that he gave himself, not because he saw himself as loved more than others, but because he was so grateful that he was loved by someone, by, by Jesus. And John is totally captivated by the fact that God loved him, and he is filled with that desire to share that love with others. And the motivation for John's message of love is really the example of Jesus. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So for John, this self-sacrificial love of Jesus is the very definition of love. It teaches him and us to love. It's about giving yourself for another person without expecting anything in return. It's about putting someone else's needs above our own. And we know that Jesus, through his life and teaching, he reversed the world's way of seeing things. You know, he taught disciples that 
Those who wanted to be great in the kingdom of God were to be those who served others. And he taught them to love their neighbors as themselves. And not just love, not just because people would love you back or to love someone from the same group or the same nationality or someone who had something to offer them, but to love even those that they would consider their enemies. And then Jesus showed the extent of God's love for us by going to the cross for us. As it says in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So John comes across as someone who's been caught up in this incredible self-sacrificing love that God has shown to him. And he tells us what difference this love makes in his life. And he's received this love from God and it has driven him to take action and to love others. And that's a big part of what motivated the churches 75 years ago to set up Christian Aid as a res practical response to the love of God. But today, sadly, in the world, we often see the impact of the opposite attitude of that self-giving love that Jesus demonstrated. We see a selfishness, a me-first attitude that leads to injustice. Um, we've seen it in the very way that COVID-19 vaccines have been kept in wealthy countries. Um, very little have been given to the poorest countries so that they can, act, they can actually access vaccines for their own people. You know, the UK and Ireland has enough vaccines to vaccinate the population twice over. And yet Kenya can only vaccinate 30% of its population. It has to decide which 30% it vaccinates. And poorer countries are paying more for the vaccinations than wealthier countries. South Africa had to pay five, $5.25 for the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the EU paid $2.15. Many of the people that we're working with around the world have no, you know, they're really struggling to access soap and water for hand washing. They live in crowded, you know, refugee camps or, or slum areas um, where social distancing is impossible. And they're unlikely to receive a vaccine this year or next year. They may not receive it in 2023 or 2024. In fact, they may never receive it at all. And yet, I don't know if you're aware, but the UK government has drastically cut back on its international development aid spending this year. At a time when the world is struggling to cope with the impact of coronavirus on top of everything else. And later in the year, you might hear, you know, about, um, you know, from the Presbyterian Church and the World Development Appeal about the impact of COVID and conflict and coronavirus and all of these things happening at one time. And yet the UK government decided to cut back. And that was a promise that they made for 0.7%. They made that promise in agreement with lots of other countries. And, um, and they have not just stopped funding projects um, that they were going to fund, but they've actually completely pulled out and are leaving countries at the moment. And we've become increasingly aware of the way in which overconsumption of the, the world's resources by the wealthiest people and nations has led to deforestation, to pollution, to climate change, and all affects the poorest people in the world who've done the least to contribute to the problem. But Jesus showed a very different way. He showed a way of putting others first. And with actions, you know, not with words, but with actions and in truth. And we're part of a coalition of organizations called the People's Vaccine Alliance that are calling on governments to do what they can to make sure that vaccines are distributed fairly and reach the poorest communities. And we're campaigning for the government to honor their commitment of, not, of the promise they made of giving 0.7% of our national income to aid those who really need it. And Christian has also been involved for many years in tackling and calling for action to tackle climate change. And this Christian Aid Week, um, we are focusing some of our work on Kenya. And Jason, if you show the next slide, um, you will see Florence, and you saw her last week in the video. Um, Florence lives in Katui County, which is in the eastern part of Kenya. And as part of the country that gets really long, dry seasons each year, and the rivers dry up completely, 
and people really struggled to get water for their crops and for their own use for drinking and cooking and washing. And Florence is a widow, her husband died um, a few years ago and she's had to continue to take care of her children and her farm on her own and she had no source of water in her village so she had to walk six miles a day, six hours a day to get water. And when she looks back in those times, she says, you know, life was simply miserable. Um, I've been walking 5K a day for a week, um, which I would normally do anyway, but this time I've been carrying two buckets of water, two full buckets of water, and it was miserable. <laughs> and that's why I'm not wearing high heels today. My feet are in bits already. Um, it was okay for the first couple of days, but then... Then I was waking up and it was the first thing I thought of was, I've got to carry those buckets another 5k today. And the, the difference in carrying something like that, and being brought up on a farm, I was well used to carrying buckets, but I never carried them for 5k. But every part of you aches. And, you know, even lifting a cup of tea. And by the way, that's another thing that's in danger as a result of climate change, tea production. So don't be surprised if tea prices suddenly rocket up as well. But for me, that 5K challenge with the buckets, that was a fundraising challenge. It wasn't a necessity. And, you know, I, I can only imagine what it must be like for, um, for Florence, who had to do that every single day. She couldn't say, oh, well, I'll just leave it today, because if she left it, she wouldn't be able to cook. She wouldn't be able to, you know, have water for her children. Now, now that I'm working from home and my desk is the kitchen table, the first thing I, I know is the first thing Ruben does when he comes in from school, he just comes in, goes hello, and the fridge opens. And the fridge is opening as the larder is opening. And he's basically looking to see what can I eat, what can I drink, because tea will be another hour away, and you know he couldn't wait that long. And um, I just think, I'm just thinking about how you know, Florence must have felt to know that you know, her children were hungry and thirsty, and how could she feed them. And you know, she had nothing to offer them, but she wasn't willing to give up. And she made that six-hour journey every single day so that her family could survive. But things have changed for Florence, and in every picture I've seen of her since, she's smiling or laughing. Now, Christian Aid's partner, Anglican Development Services Eastern, which is part of the Anglican Church of Kenya, um, they've been supporting people in her area to build earth dams and sand dams. And um, Jason, if you show the next one. So this is an earth dam, and it's, a, it's just a structure that, that basically collects the water during the rainy season, and it can be stored then throughout the dry season. And a sand dam, you wouldn't even know it's there. It's just all sand, but the water's all underneath the sand, so it doesn't evaporate off. And our partner helped Florence, Florence's community to build the earth dam and near where Florence lives. So now she only has a short walk to go and get water. And in the next slide, you'll see that she's been able to grow crops. She's been able to grow tomatoes and onions and chilies, and she's able to sell those in the market. And she's also got more time. If you spend six hours a day going to get water, it left you with very little time to do anything else. But now she's able to diversify. And in the next slide, you'll see that she's keeping bees as well. And Christian Aid supplied her with the, you know, her suit and everything. And you see all the thorns around and all the thorns around the, the bottom of the, the beehive, um, that's to stop the elephants from scratching themselves on the tree and knocking the beehive out of the tree. So that's an elephant barrier, really. Um, and one of the other things that you will see in the trees is you'll see a very simple structure like this. And this will be filled with water and it will be hanging on a tree and bees need water and uh, so this is to allow the bees and they walk down and they go into the little container and they get the water and they walk back out so even being able to fill that up with water helps the bees and is something that you know that florence wouldn't have been able to do before so having access to water has made a huge difference in her life um, but we know that many others are still struggling and the dry seasons are just lasting longer and longer, and the rains are more unpredictable. It used to be they would know this is the rainy season at this time, and this is how long they'll last for, but now they can't tell. You show the next slide, please. So, loving our neighbours in Kenya in action and truth means not just supporting them in very practical ways to help them build 
earth dams and water points and to start businesses like beekeeping. But we also need to be praying and speaking out against the injustices that are keeping people poor. Things like climate change. Um, and this year there's a great opportunity to do so as the UK will be hosting the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow in November. And Christian Aid will be calling on governments to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to support poor countries with finance, to help them adapt to the impact of climate change. So, um, final slide then, please. Thank you. Um, so, if there's one action that you could take this Christian Aid Week to show your love with those most in need, you know, um, you could choose between, or do all of them, by giving, by praying for our work, by calling those in authority to take action. And you can find out how to do that by going onto our website, ciweek.ie. You know, like John, let's be captivated by the love that Christ has shown us and seek to share this radical, self-giving love of Christ with others. As John says in verse 24, that those who obey his commands live in him and he in us. It's Christ in us that gives us the strength to live differently. And not just with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you in faith because we know you hear the prayers of our people. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and mercy, for your power and your presence. And we thank you, Lord, because you sent your son, Jesus, to put your love into action. And we pray that we can show you how we can put our love into action to help others. Amen. Thank you so much for telling us and sharing us all. That was a, a wonderful word to hear, and a great reminder of, uh, of the, the part that we can all play. Um, What's one of the first things you do whenever you get home from church? Huh? I know one of the first things I'll be doing whenever I go in the door is I'll be putting on the kettle at home and I'll be going to make a cup of tea. I don't know about you, but I, I am. My mum my mom used, to, used to have a name for what I am because I drink a lot of tea. She used to call me a druth. Have you ever heard that? You ever, ever heard being called a druth? I, I drink a lot of tea. Probably I don't know, seven or eight cups a day. I, it's a, it's a, fair, a fair bit. Of, I used to drink even more. I used to call myself a chain tea drinker. Because one was hardly cold before I'd be making the next one. And as Rosie mentioned there, and it's a, maybe a good opportunity for us to remember whenever we are uh, next making ourselves a cup of tea or... You, some of you will be coffee drinkers, and frankly, the same will apply. Just to give you an opportunity, the, the Christian Aid uh, UK have developed a, uh, um, a little prayer, a little meditation. And there are some copies of it in the porch if you'd like to take it home. And it's very simple and very easy. It's just a little thing that will help you to reflect on what's going on with climate around the world and how it's affecting how it's affecting everyone. I mean, the fact that it's affecting the tea production and the coffee production, you, know, you might think it's not a big deal, but there are countries around the world that are massively dependent on coffee and tea production and on, on the fact that we will buy it. So as the climate affects them, it affects us. But it affects them so much more severely. So I thought, just as the kettle boils there, that we would take time to pray together. So let's pray. God of all life, as we wait for the water to boil, we confess and lament 
that a rise in temperature around the world has led to a climate crisis across this beautiful planet. And Lord, we wait impatient for change. As we pour out hot water on loose leaf or tea bag into a teapot or a favourite mug, we pour out our intercessions for a change of heart by politicians to put the planet and the people first. As we stir the tea bag or the leaves or we add sugar, we ask that you would stir in us a passion to take action, to do all we can at this critical hour, to take care of this our common home and to amplify the call for climate justice. Drinking that first satisfying sip, we give thanks for the day when they will hunger no more and thirst no more. Infuse us, we pray, with a strongly brewed vision of your creation, healed and restored. Amen. Amen. So when you go home, when you put the kettle on, and maybe when you do it tomorrow and the next day, you could have this little prayer sitting and maybe take a moment to hear the challenge of that prayer and to know that you have a part to play. We're going to bring our service to a close. We're going to sing together once more. We're going to sing, uh, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. So let's stand and worship God together. of creation and the flourishing of all people for we pray in the name of the creator our father our, and the son and the holy spirit and may your blessing the blessing of god almighty father son and holy spirit be with us all today and always amen